no? Okay, just about 10 30, um, Natalie. So I think you can, can get started. Yeah. Start with the introduction. Yes, is Natalie on mute? Or? Yeah, Natalie, you can unmute yourself and start. Good morning. Uh, welcome to WZCC New York, our fall meeting. Very nice to have all of you here today. And it is my distinct honor and pleasure to be doing the introduction for this meeting for everyone. Um, let me say that it's exciting to see that WZCC New York will be continuing its record of groundbreaking and phenomenal presentations today. Okay, we have an um, excellent speaker, Dr. Alexander Nagel, uh, who I'm pleased to present. He is currently an assistant professor of art history at uh, the State University of New York's Fashion Institute of Technology. Very glamorous. And a research associate with the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, DC. Since 2006, Dr. Nagel has been working on the original polychromy of the Archimede Persian Palace architecture in Iran. Fascinating. In Washington, DC, he has curated exhibitions related to the arts of ancient Babylon, Persia, Kazakhstan, and Yemen. So we're in for something very fascinating today with a talk on business at and with Persepolis and Sousa. So uh, if you have questions, you can put them in the chat box and we'll address them uh, after Professor Nagel's uh, presentation. So, Professor Nagel, thank you very much. Take it away. All right, thank you so very much, Natalie. Um, I hope everyone can hear me. Good afternoon, good morning to everyone um, with many greetings from New York City. Um, I first also would like to thank my big thank you to everyone at the um, yeah, community here for inviting me for um, joining and sharing my research um, also about Persepolis and Susa with you. So particular thanks really again to Natalie, to Edul and to all of my colleagues also with whom I work in Persepolis and Susa and around the world to really understand the ancient economy, the site also. Um, um, and its complex um, network really of cities much better 
So I'm talking about Persepolis and Susa between about 520 and 330 BCE. So we go 2005 years um, back. And so there are many scholars who have worked on the um, economic the business also on these uh, sites. I have just a few um, listed here. Walter Henkelmann, Pierre Briand are very important scholars today who have really in-depth knowledge also. And I will um, talk about um, business and what these scholars have done and help us to understand the economy there in the next few minutes. So I want to split my presentation into four parts. I would like to talk about business transactions. What do we um, no, at this point, I want to talk a little bit more about workmen and commodities and then about uh, values and this includes material values also today um, that are related to both of these um, sites and I will also um, have a few conclusions for everyone at the very end and I hope you have lots of questions um, that um, I can also answer I hope. So um, just for the map also we have Persepolis and Susa in modern Iran. We have Babylon, another city that I will frequently uh, come back to in modern Iraq, um, to the uh, west of um, Iran. So um, these are um, the sites that I will address this morning or this afternoon on your site. And here we have again another map. And um, you see also in the lower um, left uh, screen, the largest extent of the Achaemenid Persian Empire um, between around 520 and 330 BCE until Alexander of Macedonia, Macedonia from Greece came and um, basically split this vast empire that was ruled from um, Susa, Persepolis, Babylon. Um, uh, and basically what we left today are um, amazing ruins on all of these sites um, that I will introduce here. So this is an aerial view of Persepolis. In the ancient times, it was called Parsa. So um, the tablets, the cuneiform tablets that we will um, discuss briefly, um, all refer to this place as Parsa. Modern um, Iranians uh, normally call it Tahte uh, Jamshid. So this is the, the site um, also where um, there's today a lot of tourism and many people uh, visit visit. So um, the main st uh, structures on the site were um, created between 520 and 330 BCE and this was a network really. Uh, there were other um, cities in the um, Achaemenid Persian Empire. I'm just referring here also to one important garrison, a military garrison in Elephantine that you see here in Egypt. So I have marked them this in blue. Um, so these are the, the sites that I will address in my talk. And here you have a close-up of Parsa or Persepolis, Susa and Babylon. Babylon by the Euphrates um, River in modern Iraq. And Susa is actually by another um, river, modern uh, Des or Kahe, which is probably, we have the ancient name also for this, the Ulai or Uleus um, River, as it was called back then. Susa has been excavated already since the 19th century, and this is the palace of Darius there. The remains that we see from um, that were built during his time as a ruler. We also know um, there were other palaces on this site built a little bit later. And when we have one uh, Greek source actually who refers to when Alexander um, of Macedonia came to Susa, he reached it in 20 days from Babylon. He entered the city and took over the treasure up to 50,000 talents of silver and all the rest of the royal belongings. A good deal was captured there in addition, all that Xerxes brought back uh, from Greece. So this is what we have here in, um, in the ancient reference, the Greek references also to the wealth that was um, concentrated here at these palaces um, all over um, yeah, what is modern Iran and, uh, and Iraq. So we know the names also of the, all of these rulers who um, were in charge back then. So I'm just going to refer to Cyrus the Great, whom many of you have heard about, and Darius and Xerxes, who um, 
play an important role, and I will come back uh, to why in a minute. Um, the estimated population of the empire reached from 25 to 70 million people. So this is quite a large number also. And we know that five major capitals were um, those parts where the king and his entourage would usually travel between the seasons. This was Parsa, Persepolis, Susa, Ekbatana, Pasargat, and Babylon. And there were also uh, satrapies, and um, these were I would, the easiest modern translation is probably a province. Um, and all of these satrapies had to pay also taxes um, to the king and his court um, to, um, yeah, uh, to, to bring more wealth actually to um, those sites. Just also as a reference, it took 30 days by horse alone to go from Persepolis to Susa and three months from Susa to Sardis, which is another um, city of the empire. Um, so here we have about, yeah, as I said, um, this is the span between Babylon and Susa, between Susa and Parsa. It's another um, quite of a distance. And Sardis we have here at the very um, uh, far uh, left on your slide on the image. So you see Ephesus and not too far from there in modern Turkey is Sardis. So we know um, exactly how long um, it took um, to go uh, to, to visit these places from um, and here we have a few other also um, major places in the empire. Ragai, which you have here north of Ekbatana, south to the Caspian Sea, is basically what is modern Tehran. It's a modern suburb from Tehran. So um, this is just another um, place just to mention. So um, what do we um, know about the uh, monuments there? So they were all created between 520 um, in Parsa and Persepolis and the um, mid fourth century BC, we have um, buildings made out of limestone. Most of the limestone actually is, car is um, from lo local quarries. So we have um, these quarries right next to the site. And we have from the 19th century um, already, they made kind of reconstructions in Europe, trying to envision also how um, in these sites construction worked with um, yeah, construction made out of wood. Uh, the beams also that were originally the, on the roof um, um, on these um, buildings there, most of them burned down, So, but it's important to keep this in mind. We have a lot of traces of color. As um, Natalie mentioned, this is a project that I've been doing now for a good 15 years, trying to identify what these pigments were made from. And um, so we have um, yeah, quite a number of these um, pigments preserved here on the bull. You still see or the original um, eye um, uh, surface here with the red and we have even in the inscriptions and um, the cuneiform inscriptions that are um, on the site and on the tombs of the great rulers na uh, at Naxios Tam nearby. Um, nearby Persepolis, this is the tomb of Darius. You still see blue um, actually in the inscriptions there. These are the traces from the big fire that um, occurred when Alexander um, of Macedon and his um, um, generals burned down the um, the Parsa um, to the ground. So it is calcination. This is what um, is left on the site. And we have also actual um, parts of wooden beams. Um, this is an excavation from the 1970s, where original wooden beams um, that were also collapsed, thing then from the roofs were preserved. A major find, um, though, from um, on the, this is a, an, an, a view, a sketch of Persepolis, was made by the first excavator here. His name is Ernst Herzfeld in 1933. And what you see here um, in the lower right, this is one out of several thousands of tablets made on clay. Um, and when they were sort of in a wet state, they would, um, yeah, with a fine. Um, yeah, probably a wooden stick or so, they would mark these um, uh, clay pieces. And so what we have here is uh, key information about the business transactions um, in Parsa, in Persepolis at the site. And as I said, it was um, first excavated by Ernst Herzfeld. Many of these um, were then, um, here you see Ernst Herzfeld, the man, with the, the man with the funny hat in the center. He is he's surrounded by his um, friends uh, from Europe and uh, one local um, yeah, um, Persian um, uh, 
uh, observer who would make sure also that um, the site um, is uh, being there um, well maintained during these excavations. So um, these um, are the key uh, um, finds, these uh, tablets that were found here on the, uh, you see it on the on the uh, left side on your um, screen where the arrow is. This is the area approximately where thousands of little um, tablets, often really only in the shape that fits in your hand, um, were uh, excavated. Uh, so here we have another map and um, we know um, now quite a lot about these um, business transactions thanks to um, two scholars who started studying these um, tablets, we call them the Persepolis fortification tablets. These um, were George Cameroon and Richard Hallock. So they were American scholars who started deciphering um, on these uh, very fragile pieces um, information about uh, what is uh, what we know. And the, the um, clay pieces actually uh, refer to transactions between Persepolis, Parsa, Susa, Babylon, even in some uh, instances is mentioned. And here you see some of them have even fine little um, impressions. I don't know if you can see this here on your left, upper left. This is Persepolis fortification tablet 691 where you see um, actually a little uh, um, yeah, impression that is left. And here's another one that is uh, in a modern um, sketch by Mark Garrison, who is another American scholar who works on the seal impressions. So on these tablets, we not only have cuneiform text, but we also have impressions um, that show um, images of a seal. Uh, in this case here, it's a roll um, a cylinder seal that was rolled over um, and would basically um, approve the transaction that um, uh, is mentioned here in this um, in this text. So uh, what do we know from these? Um, oh. Can you hear me again? Yeah, I hope. yeah. Went on mute okay. by mistake. Okay. Sure. So um, just very recent uh, show in, in German TV, I'm from Germany, um, that was shown showing Ernst Herzfeld here in a, by a modern actor, how he would uh, read one of these tablets. This is a little bit in an um, exaggeration here, this tablet. So the tablets is norm normally, as I said, not um, much larger than a hand um, here. So um, this is a funny way really how you can exaggerate um, this. These tablets, many of them were actually brought to Chicago, to the Oriental Institute in the uh, 1930s. And only recently um, they were returned, not all of them, but a large number in uh, different um, transactions to um, back to Iran. Here you see from an exhibition that occurred last fall in Tehran, where you see um, uh, a few boxes of these tablets um, being returned. And they had a press conference also stating the important um, yeah, information that we get from these uh, tablets. So um, what do we know from these tablets? So um, according to an estimate that was made in the 1970s, um, we learned that there was a sort of a state um, economy that we can uh, see through these um, uh, tablets that uh, rolled out then also a more local economy. In the state economy, this uh, estimate made uh, about 15,376 people who were on a payroll there between 509 and, five, and 495 uh, BCE alone. So this is across 108 villages. Um, so in these tablets, the travelers sometimes um, include one person, sometimes um, uh, almost 2,000 people. There's one tablet that refers, for instance, to a journey from Susa to Persepolis, um, where uh, um, yeah, 2,000 people are um, moving. We learn also about stonemasons who were sent from Susa to Persepolis in another uh, um, tablet, and we know that they had even customs houses, so um, that were headed by a director of payments um, um, by for a royal canal. Also, these they had canal build, uh, construction. Also, so it's not only these buildings that we see, but also irrigation um, played an important role during this time. And so we have quite a number here um, attested. 
Um, we also know that um, the name of the chief economic official of Parsa, his name was Parnaka. So if you want to name your um, next um, child um, uh, and have a, uh, an idea, he should be a businessman. Maybe Parnaka would not be a bad name. Um, he was also the great, uh, the uncle of Darius the Great, the Great, and received a daily ration of two sheep. 90 quarts of wine and 180 quarts of flour. So this was a daily ration. So this is quite um, a rich um, individual there in Parsa, in Persepolis. Of Susa, we know also about a local um, person in charge named Bakabana. And he, for instance, granted authorizations to Babylonians to transport a so-called Babylonian treasure, the term that we go uh, from um, from the tablets is named Kapnushki to Parsa. And there was also a, a text even that we know that was um, known as the Bachis, which was uh, payable in small livestock. So that includes sheep, poultry, hides, even grain. So basically it was all um, a kind of a commodities um, transfer that was shared here uh, with each other. Um, on these uh, tablets, we also have often information about gender. So we know that there were women also active, for instance, so male, female, I have indicated here. We know about the ethnicity. That means some of them we know came from what is modern India. Some of them came from what is modern Turkey. This is Lycians and Cappadocians. We know even the specialization. So we know that they had terms for leather workers, for shepherds. So we learn here, for instance, in one tablet um, about uh, some one herding the king's sheep, um, which were brought from uh, Parsa, Persepolis to Susa in, uh, in uh, one year. So um, these are the names that we uh, learn from these. We also have from the um, um, reliefs, from the stone reliefs itself, that are um, uh, were carved in Persepolis, in Parsa also, um, evidence for a large um, gifts that were uh, given to, towards the king, the great king. Here you see a dromedar or camels also that we find um, on the Apadana, which was the largest building in Parsa or Persepolis, um, which was uh, constructed uh, under Darius the Great. We also have information about businesses in Babylonia and in Egypt and in Babylon. So that is the area here um, to the west of uh, Susa. We have two sites called Babylon and Nippur. And from those um, sites, we have the names also of families who were pretty active at this time. One family at uh, Babylon and Borsippa, also nearby, is the Egibi. Um, family. They were entrepreneurs who were um, operating um, mostly um, and they had, they would basically a little bit like a bank also, they would give out also uh, loans, they would also oversee uh, transactions um, there. And so we have 1,700 tablets that have um, been found belonging to this um, archive and the Murashu archive, another important archive that was excavated mostly in Nippur. Um, so these are um, information, um, this is where the information for us comes from. In addition, we have also papyri, um, because the main writing medium in Egypt during this time was not cuneiform and clay, but were papyri. So we have papyri that were excavated in Elephantine, in a military uh, garrison um, here by the Nile River. Um, sorry. Yes, we have Elephantine here. So um, this is where we have another a large amount of, of sources referring to the business transactions there. I mentioned these um, tablets uh, from the Egibi archive. So they were found, um, uh, uh, they were excavated in the 19th century already. Unfortunately, back then not much information was kept about um, where, what find spot, but um, we know that uh, many of them were found in these inscribed pot, pots, um, the, uh, some of them excavated also in, in Babylon. And if you want to read more about these um, aspects uh, of these um, rich families there in Babylon who were operating under these um, Persian rulers, I would recommend M Michael Yorsa or Caroline Wartzegers. They are uh, really the ones who have um, done a lot of um, 
uh, work on reading these tablets because obviously it takes a lot of time to decipher um, these uh, tablets before you can make also then an estimate uh, what is actually being told here. In addition, we also have evidence for transactions, um, including gold and silver. So in Parsa, there's this one building, the Apadana, marked here in red, that I already had stated. And it was here in this very building that in the, uh, so this is building number three, the large building here um, is the Apadana. In the 1930s, um, uh, an amazing uh, discovery was made. Um, so in addition to the clay tablets that we have um, found uh, there. We have even gold and silver tablets that were buried deep in the um, uh, grounds in the Apadana and providing information about um, the one who uh, began um, constructing the Apadana. It was Darius the Great, as I mentioned. And um, so these boxes that were in which these um, gold and silver tablets were found um, were made out of stone and they were buried um, quite deep actually in the Apadana Foundation. So it was a bit of a, a, a lucky chance also that the excavators here in 1933, it, is, it was another German, Friedrich Kräfter, whom you see here on the left side, um, during the excavation of these um, uh, boxes. And these boxes were then uh, brought actually to, uh, to Tehran. So they are today in the National Museum in Tehran. And you see here um, quite interesting, uh, yeah, how well they also preserved um, these. And they are always in three languages. So um, the Achaemenid Persian Empire, all of the transactions also um, often had to be translated into several um, languages that were spoken around the empire. So here we have, um, this text is in Old Persian, in Elamite and in Babylonian. Um, uh, the same text referring to Darius um, uh, the Great and his ancestry. In addition, on the Apadana also they found coins. And this is um, uh, the earliest evidence that we have so far for um, coinage in the um, Persian Empire. Um, from approximately 520 BCE, we can come to this date because we know approximately when these coins, these currencies, were in, um, in exchange. So they, the earliest evidence for coinage actually is not from um, Persia, but from what is modern Turkey. So there we have the kings of, uh, of uh, Lydia, Lycia also who were involved in, um, in the um, creation of such uh, coins. The famous uh, King Croesus, you may have heard about um, him, is associated with um, developing also the first um, coinage here. So around the mid sixth century BCE. But it's interesting that we find these in the foundation there in the um, Apadana telling us a little bit also with which can uh, or with which regions uh, the Persian kings um, made transactions with. Because you have here, for instance, um, the, uh, the, the tortoise shell or the tortoise the turtle that you see here is, a, is evidence for an island in Greece called Egina, um, which had produced um, such type of um, uh, coins um, in the sixth century. So this is also found in the Apadana here in uh, Persepolis and just showing you back uh, quickly. So the Apadana building number three here is where a lot of evidence for gold and silver comes from. Not the only um, evidence for um, gold and silver, silver vessels um, that were very precious were obviously also used as a kind of a um, commodity and shared with each other. This is a photograph that Ernst Herzfeld um, um, had made the German excavator of an object that was um, allegedly from uh, Hamadan, from what is ancient Ekbatana. Um, in the late 1920s, early 1930s, they found quite a lot of such um, silver vessels. And in fact, today you have an, a whole set of one um, uh, such a group, um, which was um, um, spread, spread between museums in the 1960s. Um, so we have one today in the Smithsonian Institution. On the upper uh, left, we have one in the uh, lower 
um, left, which is today in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. We have one in the British Museum in London, which is on the lower right. And we have one in Tehran in the Reza Abazi Museum, which you see here on the upper uh, right. And all of them have, interestingly enough, also inscriptions, which help us to um, really um, mark again closer the date of these silver vessels. What is interesting is that in, in, um, in what is modern Italy, um, not too far from Pompeii actually, um, there is a site called Canosa di Puglia and this is where in the 19th century um, a, a, a vessel was found, a, a pot which has an interesting scene including Darius himself. You see here on the um, upper right there's an inscription Darius, I don't know if you can see this on your screen, and the king himself is presented here on this um, throne. Um, what is interesting now is the whole scene that is depicted here, so you have Darius here, you have several other um, people uh, depicted here. If you look at the lower um, side, on the lower left side, you see someone with three such um, uh, same shaped um, vessels um, bringing these um, to a man who's sitting here and probably um, yeah, doing some yeah, writing there. What we think here is probably is maybe perhaps a tax collector that is depicted here on this vessel um, to just, um, uh, yeah, so you see it's kind of these precious silver was also um, exchanged among each other. If you want to read more about all of these um, uh, transactions and the Persian Empire in general, I would recommend these two books. Um, so one by Amelie Court, The Persian Empire, and the other one from Pierre Briand on uh, Cyrus uh, to Alexander. So um, this would be um, what I would recommend. And if you want to look more into the two sites, um, Persepolis, there's a book by Ali Musavi, was published in 2010. 10, I think, and the book on uh, the great royal residence of Achaemenid Persia, the, um, uh, the Palace of Daris at Susa, has been also published in a beautiful volume that I have here. On, it's on my desk. I have it right um, next to me. Um, it's one of the best books really about um, the Susa excavations. I want to briefly um, comment just um, a little bit also on uh, my research on color because this also has a little bit to do with the business uh, transactions there. So when I started working in Persepolis in 2005, I basically um, yeah, um, went to in, uh, individual buildings on the site and uh, would look for traces of paint. In the 19th century already, they um, had identified some uh, um, traces of paint and had even made reconstructions. So this is here from one of the uh, door jams where you see Darius himself depicted um, uh, with under a, a parasol and a fly whisk with his crown. A shoe also that contains still traces of blue and uh, red was excavated and is today in the storerooms in Persepolis. There's a small museum there. In the 19th century also they made some reconstructions of um, those who are depicted at the Apadana on this one building just to give a sense of um, how much um, uh, was there. And Sterzfeld himself also noted traces of paint. In this one, for instance, in 1932, he writes, and this is my translation, he, he wrote in German, so uh, I could easily translate this. I nearly forgot to mention that yesterday, during the bare laying of a door in the Tribulon, the lower part of the relief, depicting a king with servants, the entire colors became visible. First, I had thought, that all the sculptures now buried in the earth had the natural color of the polished stone. It is black. Now it seems that the reliefs were painted entirely in bright contrasting colors. What a strange impression this must have been. He also made some uh, reconstructions of some uh, thing that he saw on the site in terms of um, original color. And we know today so that they were not only um, painted, but they also um, had uh, interesting um, matches here when something was left, for instance, on the right side, here, you see that within the circle, within the ring that um, the uh, symbol here has, you see it's, it's empty today, but obviously it was originally very much um, uh, um, perhaps uh, painted also. And um, we have several uh, indications, Herzfeld here on the backside wrote that there was gilding on the rim of the um, 
of the dress. And uh, this gilding uh, is actually still there. There is a little bit of um, a reddish ground and on top of it, we see tiny little traces um, there. On another case, number one on your uh, left on your right side is where we have two giant bulls that were created here from local limestone in the uh, around 500 um, BCE. One of them is today in Chicago in the Oriental Institute because they were sponsoring the excavations. One is in left in um, in Persepolis on the side. So this is the one that is in Persepolis and I was allowed to go there um, on this one and found quite a bit actually of traces of paint. You see a little bit of reddish here on the eye um, on your left side. And if you zoom in on the right um, side, you can still see tiny traces of blue a little bit here on this bull. If you zoom in, then you would um, find these on the surface. So the limestone was originally covered entirely in this blue. Um, uh, pigments and we have uh, quite these um, pigments everywhere on the site so I was uh, searching there. It reminds uh, me now a little bit of what we have in modern Isfahan and in other parts um, of um, Iran where you have this beautiful blue and yellow uh, kind of um, play together. This is I think what ancient Persepolis also um, at one point may have um, looked like to those who would visit the site. Included also where um, um, other uh, materials that were put sometimes onto the stone surface um, many of these um, have unfortunately, all of them actually have been taken out. Um, so uh, by past many, many centuries ago, um, people who were valuing obviously, so this might have been gold or silver um, directly from uh, those uh, monuments and we have and this is why I come back here to the business also even evidence that these painters also were um, um, were paid for in um, ratio, ratios of um, wine, of bread also. So we know that uh, in these Persepolis fortification tablets that I mentioned in the beginning, we have um, reference to painters and decorators who come uh, from villages nearby. And uh, we have even evidence for female painters on the site. So unfortunately, in this case, we have no place name, but we know also that painters from Egypt would even be coming to um, Parsa and uh, would um, have helped um, to create uh, these um, uh, decorating these uh, sites. So one of the villages, I just have it here on the map, you see Persepolis here, uh, Camphirus, this is thought to have been one of the places. Um, so today, if you walk, it would take you about 20 hours, so it's quite a bit actually, um, uh, to Persepolis and Susa you have here on the uh, upper, very upper left on your screen. So um, this is just to give you an idea about the painters who were involved with this. We know also from the um, research that I did on the site that uh, even interesting um, surface layers um, sometimes indicate um, aspects of, of uh, transactions that happened here. So in this case, for instance, we know that there was um, um, uh, bones um, from animals were involved, were crushed basically into um, little uh, consistent sense that would help to lay a ground also for some of the um, uh, um, uh, of the uh, decoration on these. Um, so there's an article that was just recently published by an Italian team who has also um, uh, worked on the site on the finishing techniques and so um, uh, we learn quite a bit about these um, individual things that would happen there. The entire Achaemenid Empire we know from what is depicted on the Apadana has its own distinctive style also here of um, dress, of head dress uh, in this case. So you see the people from Persia, from Elam, this is more than where Susa is, um, are always easily indicated while the people from Scythia in the far north, I don't know if you can see it, um, next to the Caspian Sea, um, there's also a lake there. Um, the Scythians have this very tall um, um, head, um, that's how they um, are identified. And we have even the Egyptians um, depicted here. We have people from India on the other side depicted here. So each of them um, can be identified on these uh, stone reliefs that we have in Persepolis and also at Susa in 
paintings and in glazed bricks um, based on their iconography. I just recently, about a year ago, started a project here in New York City with the Metropolitan Museum and with students of mine from the Fashion Institute. We basically took a lot of scans of the uh, stone reliefs from Persepolis, from Pasa. In some cases, um, we measured the surface quite a number of times. In this case, for instance, also today, here in the Metropolitan Museum of Art, which is from uh, one of the buildings um, on this site, which is south of the um, Apadana, probably from um, the palace of uh, Darius himself at some point, um, where we have several of such um, balustrades. Actually, this is here the palace of Xerxes, um, right next to it, where it's better preserved, actually. So we measured quite a lot of these, um, and we found um, in uh, indications that it would have been painted quite brightly um, too. Um, we, ba we then made a reconstruction and I'm sorry I cannot show this yet, it's not yet fully finished, but based on glazed brick reliefs from Persepolis, from the very same site, um, we have also much better preserved um, the glazed uh, versions of these um, um, flowers there. Uh, we can go back and reconstruct um, these um, places. To briefly, to go um, to Susa um, one, one more time. So um, Susa, as I mentioned, also excavated since the 19th century, has quite a lot of um, yeah, evidence for the Achaemenid rulers preserved on the site. And uh, if you walk today, actually, so you still stumble across all of these pieces, which were originally from stone um, columns from the capitals that were on these um, uh, columns preserved. The first excavator, Jane Dialefeu, um, on the site here, she was always dressed as a man when she went to Persia in the 19th century. You see her here. She's the one depicted um, sitting with her husband, Marcel, excavating in Susa and um, observed by uh, locals. This looks rather peaceful here. I'm not sure whether it was really peaceful in the 19th century when they excavated. But um, they brought back really from um, uh, Susa enormous uh, brick um, uh, fragment boxes with brick fragments which they could restore. And they are today in um, Paris in the Louvre. And um, oftentimes these are actually, um, many of these reconstructions are not entirely safe. But um, here we see one where um, Susa um, uh, guard guardians um, who would protect um, also the facades of the palaces there, protecting an inscription in this case. So you see a cuneiform inscription on the uh, very uh, side uh, center. You see here a close-up. Uh, some of these are modern reconstructions, but it's fascinating that we have altogether 13,000 such bricks today preserved in museum collections in the, uh, divided between Iran and France. So all of them are from Susa, from this site, and uh, they include also lions um, that we um, have seen here on the side, one compa and compare them then with other lines that were made in glazed brick at Babylon. You see them here on the upper uh, uh, part, you see the lines from Babylon. Here um, on the lower side, you see the ones from Susa. The ones from Babylon were made around 560 BCE, so about 40 years earlier. The ones at Susa, you see here um, uh, further down. We also have interesting griffins, um, symbols there, horses winged at Susa. So quite a large um, and, and flower um, decoration again, like we had also at Persepolis, um, everything was painted brightly. Brick, um, the foundations, the brick foundations, we have quite um, extensively at Susa. Um, created under um, Darius and Xerxes. And here you see parts of the um, reconstructions from the 1960s and 70s. Um, the Shaur Palace, which is um, on the left side here on your screen, um, right um, next to the Shaur uh, River, is another interesting structure from uh, the um, uh, Persian uh, time. Here you see a reconstruction that was made and we have from this one also evidence for the painters uh, for um, those. Uh, so we have at least the pot shirts on which we have the paint um, preserved that was attached to the monuments there, to the columns, and we even have uh, wall painting fragments from the Shawur Palace which show in, uh, in um, painting, painted version, what we have at other parts in 
um, carved or chiseled in stone limestone leaves. So there is an interesting, I was looking at them also, we could identify the pigments again. Some of it seems to have been more lapis um, related. So this is a precious stone that you have only in Afghanistan, where it's still being um, uh, mined today. Um, so these, obviously these distances or everyone had to be paid for this. This was the business that was going on here. In, um, we also have a so-called uh, foundation charter that was excavated um, by the French team uh, together with the Iranians on this side. And it says, um, this had been translated also, so it has been found in, in a foundation uh, in, in one of the buildings there, um, that the men who adorned the wall, those were Medes and Egyptians. So this gives us an idea again, how um, really the, the, the empire all across um, stretched so far and it was needed really to have um, commodities exchanged for, for all of these um, in the place. So here you have this um, foundation record and I'm going to finish now. I would say, suggest um, I already talked enough. I have much more pr um, uh, pr um, um, prepared, but I want to finish here at this uh, point to just um, open for questions um, that you may have already from what I already shared with you. And I have plenty of more. If you have interest um, to learn more, I'm happy to go on. Thank you. Natalie, if you want to unmute and ask the questions from the chat box. Okay, uh, let me see here. Uh, okay. Well, we have a question from Jamshade. And the question is, was Taxila and Harappa part of the Persian Empire? And how much trade and cultural ch exchanges took place with them? Excellent question. Thank you very much. So we know that the eastern provinces um, of the Persian Empire were significant contributing to um, the economy um, that happened in Persepolis and Susa. So there are workmen mentioned from uh, these um, uh, satrapies, as I mentioned before. So this is what they, the, the term is for these provinces um, from um, what is modern uh, Pakistan um, and, and beyond. Um, it is not entirely clear what type of um, uh, materials um, were mostly coming from this part. We know that um, uh, Bactrian camels, for instance, are um, visible also on, on the surface um, uh, uh, at Persepolis. So it seems that um, um, animals uh, probably were brought in from, from what is modern India from this site. And uh, workmen, definitely. The, 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 the challenge for us is really that for the um, eastern provinces, we have so little um, uh, real um, historical evidence also because unfortunately many of these um, regions like Afghanistan and Pakistan have been plundered as you know also in um, recent decades so um, there are sites in Afghanistan that have um, it, that we have indication there that they were um, also um, responsible for collecting um, uh, taxes for uh, the great king um, but um, so interesting information, in, uh, written information, um, but we cannot still exactly say what uh, type um, was coming here. There's one site called Dahan Egolaman, which is on the border between Iran and uh, Afghanistan, which has been excavated now by an Iranian Italian uh, team since the 1970s, um, where we have wall paintings also. So um, it is a little seat of a, of a satrap there, of a ruler uh, on the border between um, Iran and Afghanistan, modern times. So, um, but there has so far little um, found in terms of inscriptions on the site. Um, so the, the, the paintings that we have are um, mostly I think there are animals, uh, again, that are depicted on these um, paintings. So indicating that this might have been what has been brought from over there. Yeah, I hope I answered this question um, uh, to, to the- Thank you. Yes, I think that's, that's a great answer. And we have another question from Kersey Schroff of Washington. 
You've mentioned the inscriptions in Susa. I understand that several Achaemenian satrapies were mentioned, including Clarasmia and Sogdenia. Could you tell us something more about those inscriptions, please? Yes, so the inscriptions in Susa, this is mostly the, the foundation um, record under um, Darius. We have not the same amount of tablets, the thousands of tablets that we have in Persepolis. At uh, Susa, we have just a very small, uh, a few dozens actually of um, um, uh, records available. So, but the big one, the Darius Foundation uh, record, that um, helps us uh, to understand the extent of the empire under Darius the Great. So uh, we know that it was reaching up until, um, yeah, what is modern Turkey, basically until um, the Iauna. Uh, so this is the Ion, Ionia, um, um, is one of the most east, I'm sorry, most Western um, satrapies that is mentioned here. Um, we have Egypt also included. So um, this um, helps us to understand that uh, um, each of these brought also um, materials to Susa. We learned, for instance, that there was a precious timber, a wood, cedar, for instance, was um, brought from what is modern Lebanon and the area of um, Cyprus. So this is a region where we have um, forests that um, brought in the ancient times um, um, the best uh, timber, the best tree that you could, could find. And so this, the, the roofs that we had in, in Susa and in Persepolis of these giant palaces were made from these um, uh, large um, beams that they would bring uh, from those. And they would usually ship them also along the Euphrates. So there's evidence that um, um, there were stations uh, there uh, through which these individual uh, sat satrapies would uh, bring um, these um, materials to the capitals. I hope I answered Karsi's question correctly. Right. Okay, we have a question from Monik Bujwala. What is known about the relationship between Darius and Porus of India? Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, the, as I mentioned before, the, um, the historical records for India, unfortunately, are not um, as detailed as we have them for um, the uh, uh, Western um, uh, sites. This is mainly also due because of the, the um, 19th and 20th century, um, yeah, um, how do I say, education, the narratives that we um, learned about, you know, students in the, in the uh, universities also in the West would learn everything about Persia through the, the Greek texts. And um, unfortunately, um, uh, the uh, Eastern um, uh, provinces of the empire also, uh, what is including modern India, has never really, um, uh, yeah, uh, found such um, found its way also, and we have um, certainly the um, Avesta. We have so many um, texts that have so complicated uh, um, modern histories also in the way that they were translated, they were um, kept also archives. There, there's a whole the tradition also of keeping these old books um, uh, in in. Um, in temples, uh, for instance, or I mean, like in, we would have these texts from the uh, West, from Herodotus, for instance, and would be kept in monasteries, in, in medieval monasteries then also, where we have them written by scribes uh, who edit their comments on so on. So it's a long um, uh, way here actually still for us to go to understand the relationships between um, India and Darius, um, uh, better. I'm so sorry that I have not really uh, more information about um, the eastern uh, provinces um, here. So I think this is actually worth uh, much of a topic for another uh, discussion. And I, can, I know, know some colleagues who work on this also. So I would be happy to Natalie or Edu um, to, to uh, connect and that we have a specific talk on this um, relationship between Darius and India. That's so fascinating. There's always more to learn and explore. Here's a question from Farida. 
where are the columns that show that the Persians were the first to invent cuneiform writing? Are they in Iran today? Yes. So um, uh, thank you for this question. So writing has been practiced in the um, region of what is modern Iraq and Iran already since about 3000 BCE. So that's already 2500 years before actually the Persians uh, uh, put their empire there in the place, people would normally do everything in Kuni form. They would use these clay tablets and would write in business transactions and so on. So um, it's a very old um, uh, tradition that we see uh, much earlier. Um, some of the um, oldest um, Kuni form tablets are unfortunately today again in Western museums. So there are very few actually in um, the museums in um, Baghdad and in Tehran. So um, both are holding basically the national treasures also one can say of these um, uh, countries. Um, the, the cuneiform uh, script is a script, it's not a language. So um, we have several languages that were written in cuneiform and old Persian was an invention that was made under Darius. And the oldest um, so far attestation to this um, uh, old Persian language is on Bihistun or Bisotun. It's a mountain that is in um, uh, near Kerman uh, Shah, actually in the um, north uh, west of uh, Iran. So um, not too far from Ekbatana, also Hamadan, modern Hamadan. This is where we have a mountain where there's a large um, inscription on the wall, beautiful, preserved also, where Darius in Old Persian, in Babylonian and in Elamite um, um, uh, um, puts his own um, story basically on this mountain. And this is in Old Persian. That's the first um, evidence we have so far for this language in Kuni form. Okay, we have a question from Adel. In one of the slides, you used the word entrepreneur. Uh, what was the indication on the tablet to make this determination? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Adel. So they normally, they had described these families, the Egibi, the Murashu as bankers. Um, so the first um, people who deciphered uh, these uh, texts have thought of them as invest. Uh, being just um, um, yeah, make, giving loans also to others. But it has been, for the last 20 years, there has been an, uh, a movement in European um, scholars who worked on these archives. So notably in Vienna and in, um, in the Netherlands, there are um, people who now uh, rethink these families there as more kind of really, they find when there is a niche uh, uh, in the uh, economy, when there's a new canal that is being built, a water um, a canal, canal um, so then they quickly adapt and they find uh, um, um, uh, workmen, uh, artisans, also craftsmen who are um, mostly locally also, who um, are able to uh, um, do these works. And this is what I think this word entrepreneur refers to um, here, this has been used by these scholars, that um, they are very clever really in finding ways to um, help the um, matching the state economy um, that came from Susa and Parsa, Persepolis and Babylon with the local communities. Um, for instance, also we know that there were tapestries, there were, um, um, uh, tents in which the uh, kings would usually travel and their entourage. So they would um, need textile uh, makers also and, and those who would uh, be able to uh, um, yeah, weave. Um, and so they would usually find these families in um, Babylonia. The, they would um, uh, find uh, resources, human resources also. Uh, we know that there were slave there was slavery also in Babylonia, so um we know uh, also that people were um, um, when they made debts also they would um, obviously have to go into slavery. We have another term called kurtash for workmen in the Persepolis archives, which refers to that they were paid um, here the idea of slavery and uh, paid workmanship is still something also that we struggle a little bit with to find out um, 
when exactly what happened on which site. Okay, our next question is from Zubin Wadia, and he thanks you for your research. Uh, he says, if he recalls correctly, Briant's book, Cyrus to Alexander, A History of the Persian Empire, minimizes references to Zoroastrianism. Do you have a perspective on why he may have chosen to write about the rise of this empire without seeing Zoroastrianism as a central theme? It seems as though he assessed Cyrus to be a believer in multiple deities, Ahura Mazda, Mithra, Neith, and so on. So mm -hmm. what would your perspective be there? Great, excellent question also. So I myself also have always wondered when walking to the site, you see the symbol, also, um, um, uh, what we also today, Zoroastrians um, have so prevalent all over, why is there in, in scholarship not enough reference um, to this? So Mary Boyce, who's another scholar, has um, done fantastic work also on um, these ancient histories. Pierre Briand um, came from a tradition who was um, growing up in uh, the Persepolis fortification tablet um, uh, uh, excitement. These 30,000s of tablets that we have from this, it's, it's an amount, enormous number that were excavated in Persepolis, do not um, often make reference to um, uh, religion uh, that we can compare maybe also to uh, modern Zoroastrianism. So we have in these uh, texts references to um, Lan ceremonies, for instance, to um, uh, um, other ceremonies and other gods who um, have not, uh, we, we have not the names even of, of many of these gods. We know also that they were honoring mountains, that they were honoring rivers in these, uh, um, in this time of Darius. Uh, so it cannot um, be only um, uh, Zoroastrians who were, um, yeah, uh, the main religion. Um, it's a very complex issue. My take on it is always that I see the king was the one who was basically um, honored. So uh, this is very complex. This is my take a little bit. And I'm sorry, I know um, one wishes to have these um, connections more. For me, the king was at the absolute top of the hierarchy there. And he was um, the one who was uh, given tribute to. So when we see the um, Persepolis um, Apadana reliefs, it's always the king at the very center. And he is the one who receives um, the, the honors from uh, the, the people of the empire. It's not that there would be the uh, symbol um, uh, of the Fravar um, that would receive the honors. Um, so Pierre Briand, in my opinion, uh, is coming from this tradition of looking at the tablets which have not enough evidence for a, a, a reference to uh, Zoroastrian uh, cults in Persepolis during this time. So the, the tablets refer always to the king also and to these other deities, um, but not too much to um, Zoroastrian deities as we understand. And I'm not a religious scholar and I'm deeply also you know, I grew up in East Germany myself, and, and, and so I grew up in communism. I, we were, we not, did not even have uh, churches where we, I mean, there were churches there, but it was not something that we would um, go. So for me also, I was not growing up in, with one religion also. And this is why I was, for, for some reason, I was never really myself um, looking into these. For me, it was the painters at Persepolis that I was so excited. It's when I came to the site, so it was really, who, who were these people? And I mean, uh, maybe at one point in the future, I will be able to find even their religion. That would be great. I would love your help here, everyone's help. Um, if we can find um, whether the painters from these sites were also um, um, deeply invested in Zoroastrianism, that would be great, but I need your help. <laughs> Thank you. We're getting to the end here. We have about three more questions, okay? So are there, this is from Dr. Uh, Kar Karishma Koka. Are there interpretations of the ethics and principles by analyzing the trade inscriptions and agreements? Can you, can you extract something there? Can you repeat the question, Natalie? I, I think I didn't understand. Uh, um, would, you have, would you have uh, 
interpretations about the ethics and the principles of the people that you can extract from information about with the trade inscriptions and the agreements, does it help inform what their ethics and their principles might have been? Oh, I love this question. This is a wonderful question. I think this is really a question that we should write articles on. So yeah. the ethics of um, the principles of those people involved, I think they were deeply um, devoted to, um, to, um, to their world they lived in. So um, they, I think they had no chance also. Basically they were um, learning quickly that it was the kings also um, who had all the saying also and they were, we see images also on, um, for instance, on Bisotunis mountain that I mentioned that, um, that uh, people are carried along um, in, in fetters or in, uh, so, so I think there was also kind of a fear among people to be captured at some point and if they would not follow um, the ruler's uh, wishes so that's why they, why they were so obedient. So um, in terms of the ethics and principles, um, I personally think that very much like today in 2020, every person also then had um, um, an idea about um, what is ethical to do and what is, um, so the, the businessman that we have in, um, the, the Egibi or the uh, Murashu in Babylon that I mentioned, I don't know, I don't think that I would like them. So I would, again, still today, stay away from, you know, this is why I become an academic also. I, I, I'm not good at numbers. I cannot do business very well. So, um, but I would uh, say that these, it's not that different from today. That's, that, <clears throat> that maybe would be my answer. <laughs> okay. And we have uh, a question from Mr. Rustam Kevala. Was there any trade between Greece and Persia? Could you talk about that? And then we have one last question. Sure, thank you for this question too. So Greece um, and Persia, there is um, thought, again, Greece, even we can see part of the forests there, the um, Lebanon and the um, Cyprus, as I mentioned, um, which um, indicates that trees again, that this was something um, that was uh, um, ex exchanged with each other. We have also um, evidence that bitumen is another um, product that was used very often in the, uh, 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 in the monuments in uh, Susa and Persepolis um, is something that probably was coming from, uh, from the uh, Western uh, parts um, too. Um, it's a good question. I think though we should uh, not think that there was much of a traffic there between Greece and, uh, and Persia. I think more that the more um, wealthy, fertile parts came from uh, Central Asia, from Egypt, from Mesopotamia and from India. So we should not think of Greece as being a main uh, source of income for um, the Persian kings. So um, that's at least what I would uh, yeah, see from what I've seen so far also on the evidence. Um, yes. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, very interesting. My last question is my own question. Uh, it's so fascinating that you pursued this work and went into the polychromatic uh, background of these arche archaeological uh, sites. I'm wondering, uh, can you tell us more about how this all started? And uh, we've heard a little bit about your recent background, but uh, how did you get interested in this? Uh, and, and when did it happen? Was it when you were a teenager or when you went to college or, or later mm -hmm. on? So mm -hmm. tell us a little bit more about what got you immersed in this this line of inquiry? Thank, thank you, Natalie. So I grew up in, in Germany. I had a very classical education on ancient Greek and Latin. And I was so tired, Natalie. After, I think, after two, three years, I could not hear anymore about Greek um, uh, sources telling us the whole world. I love Greece. Um, don't under, misunderstand me here. And I have, I work even in Greece. 
but it's for me um, the, the neglected um, regions of Iran um, that uh, have interested me. And when I came for a PhD to America, this was in 2004, I took classes. So I did my PhD at the University of Michigan and I took classes there with um, a professor named Margaret Kuhl Root. And she was um, for many decades here in America also the only one who had really looked at um, Persia and at the art also of Persia. In addition, in 2003, the US had invaded Iraq and I was already aware back then that I think uh, there will be more happening in this region. And in fact, it turned out as I found out later that the US planned to invade also Iran at some point. So for me, the reason to work on um, color and Persepolis was to show, to open the eyes of Americans here also to this beautiful culture there that you risk really by all of these um, yeah, um, sanctions, by all of these, um, which always harms the normal people, the local people uh, uh, there. So one of the reasons for me was really to counter this by showing how fun Iranians are also, how I met so many good people in, in Tehran, 12 million people. You meet always a taxi driver who can tell you a good joke or you can, in, in, in Persepolis, there are people who work there on the site who have so much stories also. And I wish um, um, we would share more of these positive stories also from, from Iran um, here in America. So that's why um, I became so interested. I'm currently working also on a small um, um, exhibition on flowers in uh, ancient um, Persia. So if anyone is interested also, so I, I would like to understand better also the Homa, the, um, the, uh, the, Homa, the, um, the motives that we have all over Susa and Persepolis and the, the king um, with his flowers also in, in his hand. I think there is more here. So I'm currently working with a team of students here also to try to reconstruct some of these flowers. Um, uh, so there's still work ongoing um, as, as we speak right now. That sounds beautiful and uh, that's very inspired. Thank you so much. We're getting many comments on the chat from people from all over. Uh, thanking you very much for an excellent presentation. And now I'm going to turn it over to Edo. He's going to do a wrap up and give you our chapter thanks and say a little bit about WZCC and its global meeting coming up. So Edo, go ahead and uh, wrap it all up. Okay. Well, thank you very much, uh, Alex. I think Alex probably left to get a drink. So give him a second. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, as, as you know, this uh, meeting has been almost a year in the making. Um, we had scheduled it in February, but for unavoidable situation, it got cancelled. So, and then we had scheduled it for this year in person, but again, for unavoidable uh, reasons, it became a, a virtual meeting. Uh, but we ap appreciate uh, you making this a very, very interesting and educational talk. Uh, this is not the end, uh, Alex, since we've now come to know you, I'm sure we'll have many in-person meetings at Adar Emir as soon as we, we can on various subjects, okay? Uh, the sculptures and colors uh, which you showed were absolutely breathtaking. Uh, we also learned about the business activities and it's interesting to note it was vibrant and it seems like all business activities in some way of fashion started with taxes and taxes <laughs> keep uh, play a very important part even in today's lives. Um, I was particularly interested uh, and it was a barter system until the coinage came but I was very happy to note the word that uh, there were entrepreneurs who did you know when new technology came on took on the initiative to build it and do it and so creativity and innovation even played a part in, in ancient um, cultures, you know. Um, obviously, uh, there was no business school possibly then like um, uh, Harvard, uh, but business took place uh, based on common sense and maybe in many ways similar to what happens even in India today on the streets of India, you know. So we really appreciate your talk. And as a token of our appreciation, we have a book here uh, called Like Sugar and Milk, 
Okay, wow. and it's, and I don't know if you heard about it. It's a recent book published about um, uh, India, and there's a lot of good pictures and photographs, and I'm sure you'll enjoy it, and we'll mail it to you. Okay, thank you so, so thank very you. much, Edward. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you again very, very much uh, for, uh, for this presentation. Thank you all for participating, and it was extremely worthwhile session. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so very much. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. Bye-bye.